So far, quick summary, we've looked at the word chinuch and we've looked at seven meanings. We looked at the word lev and we discovered it really means mind most of the time. And that my mind, which controls my emotions, is what I've got to be paying attention to in how I connect to the children. Chen, chinuch, kesha she'inunira. It's an invisible connection. What's the invisible connection? What I'm thinking, what I feel, which you cannot see. But that's what I'm connecting to and I disconnect when I think negatively about you whether it's my biological child or my real student in the classroom, or my spouse, or my mother or brother, or whoever it is. But we're talking about chinuch right now in the context of education of our children. It's connecting our child to a Karish Baruch Hu. We're also going to see now that we've uh, looked at Malamed and Mora and Rebbe. Uh, we're now going to look at chinuch lenaar. So this means train, start again, have rahamim, love, the naar for the naar. What's naar mean? So unfortunately, we're stuck with a translation, which uh, again, I don't really want to go to the makar of it, but nar um, can mean young lad, and that is the translation which we're stuck with. However, the majority of times, it does not mean that. Proof. You will find in the Akedah, which we read every morning, in Bracious, in Genesis chapter 22, uh, verse 3 and verse 5. We're going to look at both of those psukim. Uh, Avram Avinu, takes Shnei Na'arav, he took his two young lads with him to the Akeda and his son in reference to Yitzhak. Oh, so all three are called a Na'ar. Who are they? Yishmael. Yitzhak, obviously, and Eliezer. Figure this out. How old is Yitzhak at the Akeda and is called a Na'ar? 37. Young lad? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Yishmael was older than Yitzhak by how much? Oh. 13 slash 14 years. Oh, so Yishmael is 50 turning 51. It's called a Na'ar. Eliezer is 76. It's called a Na'ar. Do you start noticing that the word young lad may not be accurate? How about Yeshua ben Nun? Hanar Hamasharit Lemosh Rabbeinu. In Perek Lamad Gimel, uh, you'll find that. Yeshua is called Hana Shaloyamish Metoicha Oyol. He never left the tent. He was an incredibly loyal student, the most loyal student, devoted student to Moshe Rabbeinu. And he's called a Nar. One second, you work it backwards. He was 110 when he died. Took 14 years to uh, settle Eretz Yisrael after conquering it for seven and then seven years settling it. So 110 minus 14, that's 96. Okay, he was 40 years in the Midbar before, actually 38, before he was sent out as a spy. So when he was called a Nash, he was about 46. Really? Okay. So you start to realize that many times the Torah is referring to someone as a Nar and it's not a young lad at all. You have uh, Perik Lamad Zion, where Yosef Tzadik is called a Hanar, he was 17. So let's get our, our grip on what do Chazal say the word Na'ar means. So the Reduk, he tells us, a Na'ar is a Mashart the Godel. A Na'ar, by definition, is someone who is apprenticing to someone who's independent. A Godel really means a great person because they're completely independent. So someone who's a great person in Torah, being Mashart to such a person, an apprentice, is not totally on age. And he even says, you can have a Zakain who's still called a Na'ar. Yeah. There are such psukim. Pinchas is called a Nar in Perak base in Yeshua. And there he's over 80 years old. He's called a Nar because even though the Radak points out there that even though he's actually a Zakain, when he was sent as one of the spies um, to check out Yerichai, he's still called a Nar because he hadn't finished being Masharet to Yeshua after Moshe Rabbeinu. So explains the Radak, the concept of Nar is Adam She'enu Shalem. Someone who's not finished. He's, in some aspect, he's not complete. Once you know that's the concept of a na'ar, it's not an age. It's a level of maturity, or lack of. And here, chanach le na'ar can refer to any, any age. We always associate with children, and that's, most of the time it's application. But in the real concept is, there's some aspect that this child is unfinished. Most children aren't. 
finished. They're not even bar mitzvah yet to be called a bar das, according to Chazal, where they're responsible for their actions because they can actually think and know why they or what's right or what's wrong, and they're held accountable for that. That's why the father says the blessing uh, at the aliyah of the Kriya uh, Satar for his bar mitzvah child, Baruch Shepatrani Me'oynesh Hazer. It's the Roman Shulchan Aruch. Uh, some say with the Shemu Malchus, but the concept is I am thanking Hashem that I am Potter, I am now completely exempt from the consequences of this child's actions, because now he's responsible for himself. So the whole concept of Chinuch ends right at Bar Mitzvah, now you're accountable, you go make yourself. Oh, so a child is, a, is an adult in the making. When we're parenting our children at home, our parenting is preparing our children to become parents. Our children, our children are parents in the making. Our children are adults in the making. A nar is learning, apprenticing to role models of people who have mastered, whether it's mitas, whether it's information, whether it's a craft or a trade. So you're going to this professor or you're going to this craftsperson and you're apprenticing under them because they are a master in their trade and you're learning under a master, and you're called a nar no matter what age you are. Once we understand it, it makes it much easier for us to understand. There's other meanings as well. Nar also means to shake, because usually when a person is an apprenticing, he's excited, he's moving. Le na'er means to move around, in, in, even in an abrupt way, because he's, he's a zaris. He hasn't lost his passion for what he does. So you can be 90 years old, but it, you may be a na'ar in your relationship to learning because you just you get excited like a child so uh, it has other meanings as well but this is enough for now to understand a child is unfinished and i'm here to help the child finish himself i'm here to help the child become an adam shalin i'm here to help the child continue his levels of apprenticeship under role models um al pidarke i'm going to touch on this briefly al always means above Al literally means on, but it means above. That's what on always means. The concept here is that don't look at a child with my two eyes at the same level. Always assume the child has a life outside of the classroom. There's a dynamic of which he is part of in his home. In the family dynamic, he may be the firstborn, the lastborn, somewhere in the middle. And whichever of it is, or a lonely child has no siblings, whichever it is, affects the understanding. Al means a panoramic view from above of who this child is, where he's coming from. Now, I'm not saying every teacher has to know, you know, how old, how, how old are all his siblings and what gender are they and uh, what's the relationship and dynamic between him and his parents and the, and the younger siblings, the older siblings, um, is he bullied at home, etc. But the concept here is at least, if I don't know, what else is going on in this child's life? Assume, oh, there's a panoramic view that I can assume there's a bigger picture outside of the classroom's view of this child. It's beyond the lens of my classroom with this kid. I'm going to give you one or two quick examples. A uh, true story of a, a mother that was consulting with me about a child who was sent home because he asked his Mora her age. And um, she gave him a, a, a look that she, that was supposed to be enough body language that should have made it clear that that's not appropriate. Um, the kid uh, didn't pick up on the social cue, so he repeated the question, to which she said, you know, um, go to the principal and, 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 and she'll explain to you. So I went to the principal, principal calls out the mother to pick up the kid, I know it was an extreme case, pick up the kid and explain to the kid how inappropriate it is to ask the age of, of, um, of a murder. Uh, child's about seven, eight years old, uh, goes home and uh, mother calls me up and says, which, 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 how do I explain to my kid that it's not appropriate to ask the age of, a, of a, an, an adult uh, Isha? So what's the obvious question? What's the obvious question? Why did the child ask? Ask the child. The, why am I assuming that the child doesn't know that there's something wrong with asking the age? Before you even get there, ask the child what, what was behind his question. Uh, and sure enough, I'm on the phone, she calls over, let's call him Chaim. Chaim, why did you ask your mother for her age? What's Chaim's answer? Mind-blowing. He said, 
This mother is my favorite teacher. And the assistant was talking to my mother, and I overheard the mother telling the assistant that it was her birthday. So I made a birthday card for my mother, but I didn't know what number to put on it. <laughs> a child's world then may not be what I see and hear. It may be beyond that. Give the kid a, a, the chance to owl means a panoramic view from above. Don't, why should I have such tunnel vision that I only see the child in what they're saying and how they're behaving? One second, maybe there's a bigger picture. And where will I get that bigger picture? You don't have to investigate the parents and find out from the therapist and do I don't know, re regressive therapy to find out which Gilgal the kid was in before he came into this classroom. No, Al means I can assume there's a bigger picture. Always assume it. Now the last quick story, uh, painful. Um, mother comes into PTA, broken, so broken. She cannot believe that there on the wall are the mitzvah trees and her child's mitzvah tree is bare, nothing on it. And all the other kids have these little post-its of all the mitzvahs they're doing in chesed. And um, it even got back to her that um, there's one parent who doesn't want to send her child to her son's home because you can see on the mitzvah tree chart, he has nothing. So what type of a kid is this? So mother was really broken and choked up. She explains to the mother, why are you embarrassing me in public and my child by putting those mitzvah trees on there? She said, do you know what my matzah is? My husband has cancer and I've had to take off. He's lost his job because they, they held it for a few months, but in and out of hospital, it couldn't do it with all the treatments. And now I've lost my job after weeks and weeks and weeks of trying to hold on and putting in all the extra days. I can't. I'm in the hospital most of the time. So this child who you've got no mitzvahs for happens to be my oldest kid and he's responsible in, in the morning when I go off to the hospital he lays the table he's the one who's putting out breakfast for the children and getting their knapsacks on and helping them ready for the bus and this kid I bet you does more chesed than all the, the rest of the class combined and there's not one mitzvah post-it on his tree and that's embarrassing to me it's embarrassing for, for my kid this is this is how you treat a kid now, I don't want to get into this now because it's a separate discussion about reward and punishment and um, behavior modification, but it's a frightening game, frightening game to play against our children to have uh, incentives which segregate kids without understanding where they're coming from. And one of those is uh, mitzvah trees. Uh, there are ways to make it a little bit more equitable, there are ways to make sure that we celebrate each other for our true virtues rather than put each other in competition against by default because who's got more than I have. So I'm not, I don't want to make too big a statement of that because that would get controversial and I want you to listen to the rest of the series. Um, so but at this point I'm just trying to help us understand, assume there's always Al. From above there's a much bigger picture of who this kid is, where he's coming from, what's going on in his home and that just because he's playing out in the classroom doesn't have to be a reflection of who he really is. He's got a lot of anxiety, mum and dad are going through a divorce or are divorced or uh, they would never consider divorce but they argue so much and don't necessarily make up in front of the kids that the kid thinks they're going to get divorced and, that, and it's, he thinks it's his fault because most of the time they're arguing about how to parent him. So th there can be so many factors, we, we have no clue what all that is but you're allowed to assume that there's a bigger picture. And therefore, the amount of chances I should give this kid, rachamim, rechem, unlimited. Because that's ava, that's chinuch, chen, rachamim, ava, it's all the same. That's my responsibility to you, even if I don't know all the facts on the ground, I'm allowed to assume there's a bigger picture. And the most powerful way for me to describe that is through my mouth, my choice of words, my tone of voice. Pei, the first time the letter Pei appears in the Torah at the beginning of a word, is Panim. Panim, we've already looked at, means faces. And what it really means is panim. So the same word panim means face and inside. And the letter pay, when spelt out, means pay, mouth. What is a mouth in concept? A mouth is an opening to the outside of what's inside. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Piha be'er, the mouth of a well. The well has no mouth, it's an opening on the outside to the inside, the water on the inside. Piha ma'ara, the mouth of the cave. The cave has no mouth that talks, 
so to speak. It's a mouth in the concept of an opening to the outside and then to the inside. So the whole concept of the pair is I am revealing what I'm thinking and feeling. And therefore, in all my communication with you, it's coming out of my mouth and pays the first time it appears in the Torah, at the beginning word is upon him, my facial expressions and the inside, panim. So it all comes together that the communication I'm supposed to have for my child is a panoramic view where if I do know the information that will help me be done in school on this child, even if I don't, I can assume there's a bigger picture and how I interface, that's the, con that's the connection here, how I interface P with my mouth, panim with my facial expressions, with my panim, what I'm thinking and feeling towards the child, that's what's being communicated. Now we're ready for Darkai. Hanach Lenar Alpi Darkai. Okay, so let's see, what does Darkai mean? So the typical translation is his or her way. And indeed the word Darach means journey, direction, way. Um, but we need to understand more Be'iun in a more analytical and deeper sense. What's hidden in this word Darakai? Obviously the implication is that the word Darakai tells me this child has his her specific way of being mechunach, of being educated, starting again, training, connecting. So we're going to figure out what are they. We're going to look at four aspects of darkai. Number one, if the child is not ready, is not ready for this information, but I'm teaching it anyway because, well, scope and sequence or the rest of the class is uh, up to this ice, up to this letter or up to this chapter or up to this part of the story. If the child is not ready, for example, uh, their mind hasn't finished really absorbing how shapes are different and distinguish between one and another. And I'm already pushing for this is an aleph, this is a base, this is a gimel. And it's just too much for the child. They're simply living much more in the world of concrete than the world of abstract and symbols, which are what letters really are. An ice is a symbol, it's a sign to the mind of what to pronounce with the mouth. If I'm going to push the child on something he's not ready for, am I going alpidarkai? Of course not. So number one, is the child ready for this information, for this lesson? Number two, even if the child is ready, am I going at the child's pace? So it could very well be that he is ready, but if I'm going too fast, then the child can't keep up with the pace and if he needs to go slower, not because he's slow, but maybe he needs to absorb it deeper, it takes him longer to fully absorb it and when he does it's more penetrating perhaps than even another child that's going faster. So if I'm going at a pace that's too fast for the child, is it possible that I'm not going up Darkai? On the contrary, what I might actually be doing is if the child's not ready and I'm pushing, for the Isis, I'm pushing for whatever it is that I'm teaching, Mishnayas or Gomorrah, and they're simply not ready. They don't have the minimal skill set necessary for that particular limit, for that particular area of, of learning. So what will happen in the mind of the child, they'll think, I'm not getting it, this is hard, I'm finding this difficult. I want to learn this, but I don't know it well, I don't like this, it's hard for me. And then you've got two aspects to the whole learning formula. The Technical accuracy, performance, technical mastery of the information. Aspect number one. Aspect number two, my relationship to the learning. If the child is not enjoying it because he's finding it hard, it's too much, he's not really ready, or I'm going at a pace that's too fast, what's happening to the relationship the child has to learning? Oh, it's getting more and more negative, more and more painful. And now he associates learning to pain. And eventually it becomes a situation where he's resisting. And one of the ways to resist, because he's a healthy child, is his mind wanders elsewhere. Now I start accusing him of ADD and ADHD and not being able to pay attention, uh, not be able to focus, when in fact you see that in other lessons where he's engaged and he's really good at that lesson and he gets it quickly, he's flying and he doesn't need to be focused. He's completely focused. Oh. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the child at all. So I have to go at the right pace of the child. What happens if I go too slow? Same problem. If I go too slow, the child will get bored. And now he's under-stimulated, under-challenged, and going too slow for the child could mean that really he's ready for much more. And because I'm going slow, his mind starts wandering and he starts not enjoying the subject which he's actually good at, or perhaps even gifted at. 
So we could have a serious problem when we try to apply our Pidarka and start realizing Darka means, is he ready? Am I going at the pace of this child, this boy, this girl? Number three, is this information Chaviv? If is, it, is it endearing? Is it endearing to the child? That means the information itself is attractive. How do you get information to be attractive? Well, we're going to see in the 10 building blocks, the overview, you'll see we've got hundreds of physical materials. If they're beautiful and engaging, attractive and compelling for the child to want to learn, shirashim, prefixes, suffixes, you've got beautiful materials for the aleph base, for nakudos, for blending, you've got photos for of actual words and shirashim and root words and prefixes and suffixes, you've got lots of games and activities. Oh, so Chaviv means, is it endearing to the child? Does it speak to the child's endearment? That he wants to enjoy this, he can't wait to get his hands on it. Oh, so that's also Darkai. So for example, you have a child who's artistic. So if I know that, that's a great clue. Because now I see him, he's good with blocks, or good with construction, good with Lego, good with um, writing and, and drawing and painting. That's, that's great. Now I know I can teach Aleph base, I can teach almost anything. A, B, C, one, two, three, I can teach almost anything in his way of endearment. What is, what's he endeared to? And number four, which is really important, and that's what we're going to spend the most on right now, is am I going with the child's intelligence? What does that mean? We're going to see in a few moments. Many of you are familiar with this concept, that in the educational system, at least the Western system, by and large, only really recognizes one type of intelligence, and that's academic intelligence. Academic intelligence accounts for analytical ability, it accounts for short-term memory, long-term memory, it accounts for ability to articulate one's position, perhaps superior to others. But what's really getting very interesting in the world of education, by and large, is there's a, a growing popularity that the theory of multiple intelligence is not so much a theory, but rather an observation of the reality of how children learn. Um, this is something that even though we're going to see is actually Chazal based, we'll see in a few moments, the person who really popularized multiple intelligence is Dr. Gardner. He actually got permission from the original originator of multiple intelligence, which is actually Dr. Professor uh, Peter Sal Salovey. Uh, Dr. Salovey actually, I've met him a couple of times at Gateway Seminars for Pesach. He comes, uh, visits his uh, sister there. Um, his real name actually was Soloveitchik. That's an interesting point, just a bonus information there. So he gave permission to Dr. Gardner to really uh, almost coin it under himself. So I'm going to talk now briefly about the different intelligences. Because if it's really true that Darakai refers not just to, am I ready? Are you going at a pace that I can keep up with? Or is not too slow for me? And is this information endearing to me? Is it interesting? Are you, are you talking to my love for pictures or visual or kinesthetic? We're going to see in a few moments. And are you speaking to my intelligence? So according to the theory of multiple intelligence, basically the working theory is that every child, for that matter adult, but every child is born with a different starting point in at least seven intelligences. And the educational model in the Western world, for the most part, by and large, only recognizes academic intelligence, analytical ability. And that's what we're scored for. We get a grade, get a report card, uh, and at graduation, that's essentially what we are measured by. And then that's what we're measured by for entering higher levels of education. Um, what's sad, though, is if it's really true that children have much more than one type of academic intelligence, they've got about six, seven and some argue eight or nine others besides academic intelligence, IQ, intelligent quota, what happens if the child's not shining in, for example, musical intelligence? Because there's no measure for it in the classroom when he's learning math or language or when he's learning geography or history or science. What happens if he's got strong kinesthetic intelligence? He's got very good coordination of his hands, of his legs, of his eye hand coordination, etc. But that's not being measured in math or in language or in history or geography or science necessarily. So he's going to be failing academically, even though he could be gifted in kinesthetic intelligence or musical intelligence, as, or we'll see in a few moments, all the other intelligences. So 
What we're really saying is that what would happen if we could teach math or language or science or history or geography, or we could teach Lemude Kaidesh the subjects of the Aleph base and Nakudais and blending and Shirashim and prefixes and suffixes and reading accuracy and fluency. What would happen if we could teach Mishnais and even all Tariq mitzvahs and the storyline of Chumash and perhaps most of Nach as well using materials that already reflect multiple intelligences. That means the child who would shine in some other intelligence other than the one that's conventionally taught will be able to shine in his strength in the subject that ordinarily is only seen as academic. I'm speaking theory right now but what you're going to see in a few moments as we go through uh, about seven of the intelligences and then when you see the overview of the 10 building blocks, you'll get an actual taste, literally you'll experience with your eyes at least, you'll see on screen the use of physical interaction with physical materials that reflect multiple intelligences, multiple modalities, multiple learning styles. What will happen to the child that is ordinarily diagnosed as you belong in the resource room or you're slow or you need extra coaching or private tutoring or learning specialist or reading specialist, etc. Guess what? If he's able to shine in his strength, Darakai, and it's in his intelligence or two or three of his intelligences out of seven or eight, oh, that kid will be able to shine even in the subjects they ordinarily wouldn't because it's been taught to his strength. So enough of the theory, let's now go through those seven and, uh, and then you're going to see in the ten building blocks how that actually pans out. So of the different intelligences that we're going to look at, um, doesn't have to be specifically in any order, but I'm going to start with musical intelligence and we'll define what do we mean by intelligence. We mean acute awareness. What is acute awareness? The child is able to pay attention to detail. Musical intelligence refers to acute awareness, two key words, of sound rhythm, beat, tempo. If you have a child who has a very acute awareness of music, sound, it's, he's very likely to be able to take up an instrument, to follow a song, play a tune, uh, sing to a tune. A child who's good musically, um, if he's gifted in musical intelligence, he could easily become a composer. Most famous composers were musically intelligent at a gifted level, that means uh, off the charts in terms of their intelligence in music, acute awareness of music, such that they had a very high starting point in this particular intelligence and then it grew from there, it was nurtured from there. I remember visiting communist Russia a few times and on a couple of the tours uh, I remember how it stood out how the tourist guide would try to impress on us how in communist Russia they would take kids out of school who were gifted in a particular area and send them to a school that was only for that gift, whether it was music, whether it was athletics, um, mathematics, etc. So uh, even if they didn't get a fully rounded education in the typical sense, but they learned to specialize in the area of their strength and then became experts in that. Uh, and, and a lot of that had to do with the, the Cold War, but I'm just giving you a sampling of children can have a high starting point and then it can be developed and nurtured beyond. So musical intelligence, for example, is probably one of the most, if not the most, penetrating of intelligences. So, for example, if you are taught information through music, especially as a child, the penetration is so deep, it'll probably last a lifetime with very little chazar, with very little review. So, for example, there are many of you who, uh, as children, might remember watching TV. Um, if you don't know what that stands for, it stands for time basted. Uh, you have to pronounce it uh, or mispronounce it in order to understand the joke. But uh, if you watch TV, let's say, 40 years ago, where you heard and saw certain advertisements or commercials, and now it would be played for the first time in 40 years later, I would, I would close to guarantee that you would remember the tune, the lyrics, and you could play it quite easily through your singing it. Why? You haven't done any, any Hazara, no review in, in 40 years? And the answer is, when, when you hear and see something that's played to music, and it's done a few times, as a young child, the, on, a, on an almost blank sheet of paper, so to speak, the penetration is very deep and it stays there for a long time. Uh, this has actually been demonstrated most powerfully uh, by Dr. Suzuki, uh, Professor Suzuki, what he has shown is that if you want to join his school of music, you have to sign up your child before pregnancy. 
During pregnancy, you have to play the exact same tune, it could be, let's say, uh, a Mozart concerto, thousands of times, again and again and again, to the child. After the child's born, he's not born yet, but now the child's born, you continue playing the same Mozart concerto thousands of times till around about the age three or four, where the child is brought for the first time to Professor Suzuki, and he gives the child into his hands, into his arms, against his chest, a violin to the scale of his body. And here you've got this kid who's barely out of being a toddler, it's just three, four years old, um, holding a bow and a violin, and Professor Suzuki shows him how to move the bow against the strings. And now what the child has to do is quite simple. All he has to do is match the physical movement that creates the sound that he already recognizes thousands and thousands and thousands of times. What Professor Suzuki does next is after a few months of learning to play the violin, he'll line up a couple of hundred four to six year olds who will play a perfect Mozart concerto in front of an audience of several thousand adults. And you'll see the camera turn towards the audience and you see their jaws open up in total astonishment. <gasps> and the assumption, mistakenly, is that every single one of these kids is a child prodigy and musically gifted. And what Professor Suzuki has demonstrated is that they were not necessarily gifted. It's just that if you subject a child to music thousands and thousands and thousands of times, his mind starts to pay attention to the subtle differences of one sound to another. And because it, it's so many times reviewed, it's an easy movement to figure out how to match that sound already printed in his mind. So musical intelligence is very powerful. Number two of this, not in any specific order, is mathematical intelligence. That's acute awareness, two key words, acute awareness of numbers. They're quantifiable quantity and they're relative quantity in relation to another number. So the children who are mathematically intelligent, they will typically see sequences, patterns. They're very good at order. A child who's good with math if you give them information that's chronological, it's easier for them to grasp because there's a mathematical sequence. They see patterns very easily. Accountants are typically mathematically intelligent. Architects very often are mathematically intelligent they, or on, at a high level of giftedness. Number three of this is language intelligence. Language intelligence is one of my favorite, sorry. Uh, language intelligence actually has nothing to do with spelling or grammar. Uh, language intelligence is redefined, if you like, is defined as acute awareness, two key words, of words and their multiple meanings. Such that if you have a child who hubs, he grasps how a word can have multiple meanings, uh, children like that often grow their vocabulary, they are able to sell almost anything. In fact, good salespeople are often language intelligent. Good teachers are often language intelligent. Politicians are usually language intelligent. Personally, I think it's the only intelligence they have, but that's not a politically correct statement to make. Uh, yeah, language intelligence is a, an ingredient in leaders who have the quality of persuasion, power of the mouth. So it has nothing to do with, with grammar or with spelling, such that a child could actually be failing English and yet be gifted in language. And there's no steerer, there's no contradiction, because we're redefining language as acute awareness of words and their multiple meanings. Uh, moving along, number four of this is um, kinesthetic intelligence, or we call it body intelligence. What does body intelligence mean? We mentioned it earlier. It's acute awareness of one's limbs, acute awareness of the coordination of pace of the feet, legs, arms. Good athletes are typically body intelligent. Um, dancers are usually body intelligent. If you have an athlete, for example, who's gifted in running or leg coordination and playing soccer, basketball, um, their starting point is very high, they're gifted, and then they develop that further, they become professional. Number five of this is spatial intelligence. What is spatial intelligence? Spatial intelligence is acute awareness of space, such that you have a kid who walks into a, a room and 
He has acute awareness of height, breadth, size, colour, contrast, shade. Typically, artists, good artists, are spatially intelligent. Graphic artists, good graphic artists, are often spatially intelligent. Architects usually are gifted in spatial intelligence and they grow from there. Sometimes math and spatial intelligence, there are overlaps over here. You will have, for example, a very good painter is usually spatial intelligence. They, from memory, will remember or create from their own imagination uh, a beautiful scenery or beautiful picture. So spatial intelligence has a lot of interesting applications. Uh, number six and seven are twins. And they're known as EQ, or emotional intelligence, uh, emotional quota as opposed to intelligence quota, IQ. And EQ is broken down into two parts. It's an umbrella that contains two components. Number one of, we'll call it number six, is um, interpersonal. Interpersonal intelligence. And uh, number seven is intrapersonal intelligence intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence refers to the acute awareness one person has for another person. Specifically, another person's body language, facial expression, tone of voice, choice of words. Someone who's interpersonally intelligent picks up very quickly if there's a switch in the other person's mood or body language or tone of voice and in that switch they are sensitive to back off or give more space or get more involved. Interpersonal intelligence has to do with reading other people, it's acute awareness, um, and having the tools to interface, interpersonalize with each other. So for example, kindness is interpersonal intelligence, emotional intelligence. You've got giving, that's emotional intelligence. Love, respect, appreciation, gratitude. Those are all emotional intelligence. Devotion, loyalty, Integrity, giving, generosity, forgiveness, that's a real biggie. All, all these are part of emotional intelligence under the umbrella or under the uh, aspect of interpersonal. Intrapersonal intelligence has to do with acute awareness of me, specifically what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, such that if I'm intrapersonally intelligent, acutely aware, I'll notice quickly when there's a switch in my mood or what I'm thinking. And in doing so, I pay attention to that and realize I need to give myself uh, more space or control my emotion or my anger or frustration or whatever it is that um, I'm dealing with or struggling with. So intrapersonal has to do with noticing my own emotions and what I'm thinking. For example, if I'm intrapersonally unintelligent, I'm slow, I don't pay attention, so I'm not even aware that much. It could take me weeks, months or even years or decades for me to become more intrapersonally aware of myself such that um, I easily let people take advantage of me until finally I figured out that I'm, I'm letting everyone schmutter me and I'm going to not always say yes all the time because I'm so afraid of being rejected if I say no. So if I'm intrapersonally unintelligent I may not be aware of where I'm really coming from and it will take a lot of introspection or therapy on the outside for me to see myself inside to become more sensitive and acutely aware of myself intra personally. So if you take all these seven, and there are theories that there's a nat natural intelligence that's a acute awareness of nature, uh, spiritual IQ is something that's been uh, speculated, I actually have a, a lecture on that, you can probably get it from jewishinspiration.com, I think it's on there, but in the meantime these are the seven most common and popular ones that are being understood. Now what's important to understand over here is really the following, if it's really true that human beings are born with different starting points in each of these seven intelligences, then in theory at least, what do you think would happen if a classroom had lots of physical materials that reflect multiple intelligences in the use of each material? And that by teaching Chumash, Nach, Mishnah, what would happen if by teaching Isis, Nakudais, blending? What would happen if you got hundreds of materials, literally hundreds, a photograph for every major Shoresh in Chumash? What would happen if you got lots of ways of teaching prefix suffixes which are concrete and with pictures or color coded so that children who are spatially intelligent get it really quickly, uh, visually strong, kinesthetically or auditorily? What happens if you hit a kid on any one material with three to five intelligences in any one material? 
Guess what will happen to the child that's not academically strong, he's weak there, but strong musically, or strong spatially, or strong kinesthetically, bodily, or strong in language. Oh, he's going to shine in his strength, darkai, in his way. Now here's where it's really interesting, in my personal opinion, uh, emotional intelligence, which is what this is called, inter and intrapersonal intelligence, all comes under EQ, emotional intelligence. Um, let's figure this out together. What is the wording in Lashon Kodesh for emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence really has a lot to do with everything. It has to do everything with Bein Adam Le'atzmei, Bein Adam Le'chavere. Even Bein Adam Le'makim, in my personal relationship with myself and with others, and even with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, Avas Hashem, Yiras Hashem. This, this is strongly connected to emotional intelligence. His love was excitement and passion in mitzvahs. Uh, excitement about Torah. Hashem Bachabanu Mikolamim, Kavan and Tefillah. His love was in Simcha and Tefillah. Kavan Asaleh. All these are, have emotional components. Simcha Sechayim has a lot to do with what I'm thinking that affects what I'm feeling. So it's all about interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence. Getting along with other people, respecting other people, being done the chus and other people. Ahavas Yisrael, Ahavas uh, These are These are interpersonal intelligent components. There must be a term for it. If this is a reality, what's the term for it in Lashon HaKadosh? And the obvious answer is, what's the word for character in Lashon HaKadosh? Oh, Midah. When you say someone's a Baal Midas, you mean they are in control. Baal means owner or husband of, in control of their character. And the word Midah has another meaning. What is that? Oh, also means measure. Now, Rebenshler, at a master universe, you, you, know, you have unlimited imagination. In English, you've got one word for measure and a separate word for character. Why in, in Lashon Agade does you have one word, Midah, and it means two things, character and measure? There are no mistakes in Lashon Agade. What's the true measure of a human being? Shape of the body, height, waistline, how much money in my bank account, savings, zip code, size of my home, car I drive, corporate position I hold, uh, how many letters are in my name, or none of the above. What's the real measure of human being? Oh, midas, character. That's why the word midah means character, because that's the real measure. And that's all to do with inter and intrapersonal intelligence. Now watch this. In any classroom, almost in history, that you remember being in elementary, high school, yeshiva, university, wherever you went, was there at least one straight A student in every class? True or false? Absolutely true. Now, let me ask you honestly, what do you think is going through the mind of every other child, student, in the class, in answer to the question, who in this classroom is a candidate for success in life? C student? B student? A student? Oh. But let's ask a, a really frightening question. What counts the most in life? What's going to really count in the real world? And will define the real world? Marriage! <laughs> Building a marriage, staying married, not easy. Raising kids, not easy. In the real world, earning a living. Getting along with different and difficult people. Building up clientele, getting along with the clients. <laughs> oh, let me ask you, in the real world, what will count the most? Mathematical intelligence, analytical intelligence, academic intelligence, uh, language intelligence, musical intelligence, spatial intelligence, emotional intelligence. Take emotional intelligence on one side of the scale, put all the other intelligences on the other side of the scale and ask yourself, in the real world, raising a family, staying married, getting along with different people in the workplace and building my panasa, my livelihood, which of all these, if you put just emotional intelligence on one side of the scale and all the others on the other side of the scale, which one will outweigh all the others combined? Oh, meters, emotional intelligence. How does that play out in the classroom? The interfacing of the teacher with the child. Does the teacher smile? Does the teacher smile consistently? to the point of being almost constantly. So that just the removal of the smile is enough of an einish, enough of a consequence to get the kid thinking, what did I do wrong? I heard that from Rabbi Shimon Schwab at Sal, that just smiling alone is your most powerful tool for discipline. That if one's consistently, and that is discipline, 
consistently smiling at the children such that when you remove your smile, the first thing that goes through the mind of the child is, why is the Rebbe disconnecting from me? Remember Chinuch Hain? Hain is Keshe She'en Onira, that you can only see on the outside, but you don't actually see the invisible, what's going on up here and in here, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. Oh, but your smile says you're happy, I'm in your classroom. Oh, removal of that smile is a very powerful disconnect statement that gets me thinking, what did I, oh, I know what I did wrong. I shouted, or I said an inappropriate word, or I wasn't respectful, or I, I took this person's work, or I copied this person's work. And now I get a choice to do teshuva, correct myself, or deny and accuse and blame. Oh, so the whole concept here is that the connection that we're making with our children in the classroom consistently in how we answer with a raised voice or with a soft voice, with patience, with listening, with empathy, giving another chance, another chance, and not artificial pity, but genuine rachamim, genuine compassion, genuine empathy, gem, genuine believing that I'm going to be patient as many times as it takes for you to get it right. And I'll even, if necessary, if I, I'll work with you outside of school hours to help you or figure out another way so that you get this math, get this Shroshim, get the reading accuracy, get the reading fluency, get the Gemara, get the Mishnayas, get the background information, the Klalias, Yudias Klalias, whatever it is that I'm teaching. My connection to you in the emotional intelligence component of the classroom is massive. Because you ask, as we said earlier, ask a child who, which adult in his life does he like the most till today, he will always single out the same profile, the one who appreciated me the most, the one who trusted my intelligence, the one who brought the best out of me, the one who gave me another chance, the one who believed in me, the one who loved me and admired me and said so. And that's all in the arena of emotional intelligence. And therefore Midas plays a massive role in the classroom itself. There's much more that deserves to be said on this subject, but I think we've covered this main point about Darkai. Darkai refers to, is he ready? Am I going at their pace? Is this information taught in a way that's chaviv and interesting and stimulating, relevant, valuable to this child, this age? And number four, am I going with the child's intelligence? Am I teaching this in lots of different ways? Rebbe, a lot, abundance, rav, lots of different ways to reach different minds. So we've looked at a lot of vocabulary and defined it based on Lashon HaKadosh and Chazal. Chinuch, we've looked at seven different meanings. We've looked at Rebbe, Melamed, Mora, Machanech, We've also looked at the word lave, comes up a lot in the Torah. And we've also looked at the whole Pasuk, Hanukh Lenar Al Pidarkai. We've looked at four different meanings in Darkai. We've also got a hint of the delivery system. The method in the system is draw out from the child by asking questions. My Mamukim Eitzabalevish. There are deep waters in the mind of every person. Vishtvuna Yedlena. And the master teacher will draw it out, ask questions. Gemara and Baba Kama, Mave ze Adam. Boi means ask, seek. It's a, a pasuk in Yeshayahu, Perakaf Aleph, pasuk Yud based, chapter 21, verse 12, where im taboi, boi, if you want, seek. And Lashon boi is seeking, asking, extrapolate. Drusht, dash, means to extrapolate from the language of taking a pea out of a pod on the Malach of Dash on Shabbos. Unfortunately, most Translations use the word interpret, which is actually the exact opposite. Because dash means to take out what was there all along. Interpret means to impose my mindset, my background, my cultural environment of who I am, which is the sum total of everything that I'm coming from, and now look at a pasuk and give you my interpretation. That's, no one's interested in my interpretation. Drush, dash, means I have to show you the pshat in the words. I can come up with my pshat, but if I can't show you where it is in the words, that's my pshat and that's interpretation. No one's interested in my interpretation. Drush, medrush, means to extrapolate. So the whole concept here is that we want to give the children the tools whereby when they look at a pasuk, they look at a mishnah, they look at the gemara, they're not imposing their mind. They could have a wealth of knowledge based on Tanakh and Mishnais and gemara that when they apply to the learning, they're able to extrapolate the meaning of the words, or a pshat, based on what's inside the words itself. It's not about interpreting me on the text. So 
Now let's figure out the consistency of this method of extrapolating from the mind of the child and getting the kid to think for himself so that when he looks at a pasuk, it's not rote memorization of what the words mean in English, it's his understanding of Lashon HaKodesh so that he can actually see questions and research answers to the text itself. Look at how Chumash was written by a Kodesh Baruch on the dictate to Moshe Rabbeinu. Is it so clear every single Pasuk that I understand, every Pasuk, just because I know Shrashim prefix suffixes? Or what's actually going to happen when you've got the minimum skill set of knowing all the Isis, all the letters, all the Nakudais, how to blend correctly, read accurately, read fluently, enough of a critical mass of Shrashim, of root words in Lashon HaKadosh, and prefixes and suffixes, basic grammar, so that when you look at a Pasuk, you can make sense out of it. Yeah, make sense out of it. Guess what's going to happen now that you have those minimal skills and you're a yingle, you're a young child in the midbar, in the desert, and your father's teaching you for 40 years, from Matan Torah till entering under Yeshua and to Eretz Yisrael, you're learning 40 years the Chumash. What's going to happen as soon as you start reading? Are you going to understand the Chumash? The storyline, there's two components to Chumash, the storyline and Tariq Mitzvahs. Storyline, Briyas Olam, till Yeshua enters Eretz Yisrael. Ten generations from Adam till Noach, Marble, ten generations till Avraham, life of Avraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov, life of Yosef, Shibud Mitzrayim, Matan Torah, 40 years in the Midbar, end of the Chumash, Yeshua enters Eretz Yisrael. In these 2,488 years, there's a storyline. Contained throughout the storyline are Tarek Mitzvahs. Those are the two skeletal definitions of the Oiraisa, the Chumash. You're reading the Pesukim, intertwined all over the Sukkim are Tariq Mitzvah, 630 instructions. None of those two components make any sense. Not a single Pasuk makes any sense. They're deliberately written so you are forced to think, ask questions. Lashon Yachid is supposed to be Rabbi. Rabbi is supposed to be Yachid. Zohar is supposed to be Kevin. Kevin is supposed to be Zohar. Bresh uh, is Bara. Bara is singular. Elokim. Elokim is plural. So it should be Baru. Oh, Ela told us Noach should come next is the names of the children. These are the children of Nayach, Shem, Cham, and Yafis. No, no, that's what it says. El tells Nayach, Nayach. Whoa. <laughs> you start realizing, you can open up almost any Pasuk, and you start realizing the grammar doesn't make sense, the Pashup Shat doesn't make sense, and there's not a single mitzvah in the Torah that makes any sense. Not one, even the most simplest of them. Every mitzvah is not enough detail. All the missing details in the Torah Shabbat pair. Oh. When you learn Chumash, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it on dictate to Moshe Rabbeinu so you can understand it, you're forced to what? Think and ask questions. Because it's all about dialogue, meeting of minds. It's all about acquiring it through your research, extrapolation, seeking, asking. And through Drisha, Chakira, and constant investigation of the possible meaning, you're going to dig up the missing information, which is, of course, the Tarsh Balpeh. In the beautiful analogy offered by the Baal Shem Kaddish, he says, the Tarsh Bechtav and Tarsh Balpeh, its relationship is in the following washal. You have a king and he wants to bestow, bestow all his treasures to his son. His treasures come from his father, the king before him, and his father before him. And there's, there's generations of kings with all the treasures they've accumulated from all the conquests. And now he wants to give it to his son, but he doesn't want his son to just get it without working for it because then he's not going to value it. So what does the father do? He builds a perfect palace. Beautiful, beyond description. And he says to his son, I want you to know this palace is perfect. There are no mistakes. If you see a tile on the floor, crooked, out of position, a bit higher or lower than the rest of the tiles, and it's not flush, it's not a mistake. The palace was created with perfection. If you see a tile out of place, that's a clue that if you dig behind there, you're going to find treasure. You see the wall meet the ceiling and it's not completely perpendicular, it's not at a perfect right angle. That's not a mistake. There are no mistakes in this palace. It's perfectly designed. If you see something that looks like a mistake, dig behind there. It's a clue. You'll find treasure. Says the Baal Shem HaKadosh, the Torah Shem the written Torah, is the palace the Tush Balpeh is hidden behind the seeming mistakes of Lashon Yachid Rabim, Zachar Nekeva. The grammar is not consistent. Elatotas uh, Nayach should be Shem Chaman Yafes. No, it says Nayach. 
Oh, that's to teach us that the main person you give birth to is not your child. That's secondary. The biological child we bring to this world is not the Ikka told us Sehem Shal Tzadikim. The main child we give birth to is Masim Tovim. Who do we shape our character through our own deeds? Oh, it's us we're giving birth to throughout our lives. That's the first and foremost told us of Nayakh. Then the next part tells me, oh, by the way, the biological version is He gave birth to three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafis. Every Pasuk is screaming out, Darsheni, extrapolate from me. Open me up, dig out the hidden treasures. So we're giving the children that ability. And the whole Chumash was designed anti-rote learning. Anti. It's all pro-investigation. Ask. Challenge. Let's figure this out together. Even when Rabbeinu HaKadosh, 1300 years after the Tosh B'chtav was given, and the Tosh Pair was transmitted orally, without being written down formally, except privately, different Nevi'im and, and Shoftim had their own notes, uh, B'nai Nevi'im, but otherwise it was forbidden to write down. Rabbeinu Yudanasi, Rabbeinu HaKadosh wrote down the Mishnah, and when he wrote it, what's the format? Extremely organized. Shisha Sadarim. Six sections broken down to the 63 Masechtas, 63 different tractates, volumes, and each one has its own name, and each one is broken into a subdivision of numbered, named chapters, and every chapter has a numbered paragraph called a Mishnah. Rabbeinu Akadosh organized Tariag Mitzvahs under Shisha Sadarim, six sections. And then you'll say, great, I've got the missing information. <laughs> no way. The Mishnah has written such a kitzaloshan, it's so abbreviated, the language is so cryptic, you're forced to think, ask questions. You're forced to get your mind engaged, draw out the possible answers, and it becomes analysis. Usually translated as machlekes, it doesn't really mean argument, it means more discussion of all the possible aspects, from mutter to asa, both ends of the spectrum. And if both answers this conclusion of Rabbi Yossi is Asa, and Rabbi Meir says it's Mutter, but both use the 13 mid of Shah Torah and the Dreshes by him, all the principles by which you can legitimately extrapolate information, even if you come up with two opposite positions, both are legitimate. Both are considered HaKadosh Baruch Hu's spectrum, and you can paskan into the future based on knowing what are the full perimeters of the spectrum of the applications from all the way Mutter to Asa. So comes along Rabbeinu HaKadosh and writes the mission, such a kitzeloshan, he's preserving the process of learning through challenging the mind. And even when they wrote the Gemara, what's the format? Question, answer, problem, solution. They'll even find a problem with the solution and then go off on a seeming tangent. The Gemara is the dialogue of tearing apart the Mishnah, figuring out why it's written this way and why not that way, why are you quoting this Pasuk, why not this Pasuk, oh but we have a Brysa that contradicts this Mishnah and it's constant meeting of the minds, dialogue, forcing people to think, getting the student to be in the driver's seat with Rabbah, Abaya, with the Tanaim and the Amaraim and the Ga'inim and the Rishonim. That's what learning really is, is Milcham Tashel it's a battle of minds. I close on this point in trying to put this all together, that by giving our children, what you're going to see soon is the 10 building blocks of Chinuch. But by coming from the Hashkafa of what Chinuch, in the words in themselves, scream out, I am about connecting to the children, Chain. I'm about giving the children another chance, another chance. Chinuch is training, starting again, Haschala. Chinuch is all about love, Ava, Rachamin, going the extra mile. Another chance. It's all about Melamed. I'm here to extract from your mind all the possible answers. I'm going to help bring out of you your talents, your strengths, your clarity. But I've got to give you a lot of vocabulary. I've got a little bit of diktok here and there so that you can actually analyze yourself. But if you don't, then I'll, I'll have to give you a few more gifts of the Torah till you can figure this out yourself. But my real goal is to make you independent. And this brings us back to the beginning where Rashi used language in Parag Yudalat, Pasuk Yudalat on Vayarek uh, Hanichav, who Lashon Chinuch is a Lashon of Haschalas Knisas Adam, the beginning initiation of a person entering an Umnas She'atid La'amoid Ba. 
Lamoid, Amida is Lashon of Independence. Look at the first Mishnah in Pirke Avais. Pirke Avais is unique. It's all about Ben Adam Atzmai Lechaver Lemakim. First Rav Batanur on Pirke Avais tells us it's unique because all the other Mishnahs are perush to Tarek Mitzvahs. This one is not. It's all about Midas. And in the first Mishnah, we're talking about this is a Masora. Moshe Kibbal Torah Masinai U Masro Lashua Shuas Kenim Kenim Nevim. The Anshekinis Agadola told us three things. What are they? Think before you decide. And think deliberately. Yeah, you've got to use your mind. And it says, stand up many students. What a strange language. What do you mean, stand up many students? So says the Beis Yosef on that Mishnah. Isn't it interesting that it doesn't say vehemidu har betalmidim? Because there the grammar for sure means stand up many students. But it doesn't say that. The Mishnah says vehemidu talmidim har be. The har be is going on the hemidu, standing up. Stand them up again and again. How many times will a child fall till he stands? As many times as it takes till he stands without falling. How many times will he... Walk, fall, walk, fall, until he can walk without falling as many times as it takes. Stand them up again and again. In the Loshan of the Beis Yosef, on that Mishnah, Perkei Aves, Perk Aleph, Mishnah Aleph, let me share with you his actual language. Provide all the needs for them to stand on their own. You see, it's all about independence. Give them the raw materials to stand, stand on their own. Olive base, nakuda, blending, shrashim, previous suffixes. But you know what's going to endear the child to want to learn? Your connection to the child. And that's in the word malamed. Extrapolate. Let the child see. Wow, my Rebbe is showing me how intelligent I am. My Rebbe is showing me I can figure this out myself. What a celebration that you didn't deliver the information into my brain, you helped me find it myself. Wow, what a discovery. What an amazing feeling for a child to realize, I can do this by myself. This is what we're really talking about. Chinuch is all about chen. It's all about connection. It's all about giving the child independence to believe in himself, build a self-esteem based on reality, not pumping artificially, what a good boy, oh, it's a great job, oh, you're so wonderful. If it's not hooked onto an actual, you figured this out yourself. You identified what's the Shoresh, the prefix and suffix. You saw a Kasha and you figured out the answer. We looked in Rashi, Sephorno, and there's the answer. And look on the timeline of Jewish history. Oh, look where Rashi is. He's one of the greatest commentators ever. And you had the same Kasha. You had the answer of the Toysfus. You had the answer of the Rosh. You had the answer of a question of the Rambam. How does the kid feel? Oh, it's a million dollars. And now, He's dialoguing with the great tzaddikim, Tamadei Chachamim, of our Torah. That's Milcham to Shel Torah. I close this point on Reb Shach. Reb Shach, masterful teacher, he doesn't need my recommendation, but anyone who learned in Panovich will know that his Mahalach was very simple. When he taught, he started his shir with a bummer kasha. The kasha would throw every Everyone in the best marriage into uproar. They're all screaming, shouting, arguing back and forth. He gets away from his shtender, walks around the best medrash, listening in to the chabura, so to speak, of everyone's argumentation, discussion of the kasha. Then he listens in, goes back to shtender, gives a clap and says, Rabbi Sai, he puts together a binion based on all that he's listening to. And then he throws in a new kasha, tears the whole thing apart and erupts the whole best medrash again. That's Milcham Teshel Terah. It's not delivery of information, test, quiz, delivery of next level, test, quiz. It's the children, the students, engaging their minds in the process. So that the results, if there's going to be a test, is real to my relationship to the learning. It's a result of my relationship. It's not a result because I've got to pass the test to get to the next level, or because I want to please the Rebbe, or I'm in fear of my father, or my parents' disappointment. No, I love the learning. That's why I'm learning it. I'm engaged in it. It's part of me. That's what we're looking for in helping our children connect to us. And chinuch is chen chaf vav, connecting our children to a Kaddish Baruch Hu.